I'm going to turn the lights down a little. I'm going to talk about the mission for a number of reasons. One is I have a personal interest. I've lived in Bernal Heights for uh, about 33 years now in the same house. Uh, last time I gave this speech, someone wanted to start an argument about whether Bernal Heights was part of the mission, but we, we can deal with that later on. Um, after the South of Market District, the mission is the city's oldest working class neighborhood. Because of the resistance to what the redevelopment agency did in the Western Edition in the Mission District, the district is largely intact. Uh, there was massive destruction, as we'll see, of Victorians in the Western Edition. It didn't happen to the mission because of, the, of community resistance. So the mission, uh, in terms of the development of the neighborhood, the development of its architecture, is full of lessons about neighborhood activism and community-based planning. And uh, you can see from where I'm going is that Yes, my book is about architecture and history, but it's also about how the community gets involved in architecture and its own history and in, in planning. Um, the Mission District, I'll talk about how it's made major contributions to the city's culture, contributions that are um, known outside of San Francisco, even outside of the United States. We'll also talk about it as a neighborhood that's under pressure. Uh, facing an uncertain future. So I'll talk a little about the fight over the dot-com, dot-gone phenomenon and the issue of affordable housing in the city. And as you'll see in my talk, I'm going to relate the issues of preservation, which we associate with uh, perhaps upscale living with uh, a more working class type of neighborhood. Here's the Mission District, seen from Bernal Heights. Uh, downtown, of course, and we're looking down Folsom Street and over here, this is Baby Federal, about 22nd in Mission. So it's all familiar. It's familiar to you if you know the city well. Here's General Hospital, Petro Hill. So it's this large basin here is, is what we know as the Mission District. This is how it looked last year. Next. Whoops, I've got the machine. And this isn't the Mission District, but it's close enough for us to get a sense of what it looked like uh, about the time of the arrival of, uh, of um, Western Europeans, or soon after the arrival of Western Europeans. This is actually Ninth and Mission, not far from here. But you can see a very forbidding landscape, lots of, land, uh, lots of sand dunes, not very much in the way of trees, kind of scrubby, 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 scrubby trees, and a very inhospitable uh, physical environment. And we'll talk about this later on, but this is the Plank Road, which was the first connection besides a, a, a mere trail between uh, the village of Yerba Buena, which became San Francisco, and the Mission Dolores uh, that was built in about 1851. Next slide. The first inhabitants, of course, were native Californians. There were, when uh, the Spanish showed up in 1776, there were approximately 160 people living very close to where Mission Dolores was established. They called themselves Yalamu. And in the city of San Francisco, there were three communities, one in Visitation Valley, one in the Mission District, and one out near Fort Point that were uh, semi-nomadic, semi who were living in this area. This wasn't an area of, of large population for Native peoples because it was a fairly fit, forbidding environment. Mission Dolores was built um, over a period of time from 1785 to 1791. Here it is in 1856. It was built, the original building was built, which was just a brush shelter, was built in 1776. When the Spaniards arrived uh, as part of an effort to build 21 missions along the El Camino Real from Southern California up into Northern California, Spain was very concerned at that time about the encroachments in Northern California by the British, the French, and the Americans, and the Russians, who were here primarily out of interest in, uh, in seal, uh, seal skins and sea otter skins. So as part of the effort to uh, establish Spanish control over California, they built the Presidio and they built the Mission Dolores. And this building was actually designed by Francisco, Father Francisco Palou. And as I said, it was built from 1785 to 1791. It's very much in the style of Mexican and Spanish ecclesiastic buildings of the time with its tiled roof and its heavy adobe structure. And actually, I learned recently that it sits on large pieces of serpentine that were quarried nearby. The, uh, the mission had, this is the interior of the mission, and uh, I note the ceiling here. 
uh, it's a native design that's been restored recently. It was thought that the uh, native population that was basically enslaved by the Franciscans at the mission um, painted the ceiling according to the kind of patterns that they use in their clothing and, and other articles. Uh, the arrival of the missions, the missionaries, which was uh, meant to establish to convert the native population to Chris Christianity had a disastrous impact on the, uh, on the uh, people living in the area. The first real encounter, first negative encounter between the missionaries, between the Palu and his people in the, uh, in the local population occurred very soon after they arrived when uh, one of the native people attempted to kiss the wife of one of the soldiers and was killed. And by uh, the 18, 30s, virtually all the villages in the Bay Area were deserted either because people had been rounded up and brought into the missions or onto the mission farms, or um, and among those people or had fled, and among those people who were converted were about 72,000 people. Um, only about 18,000 of them survived, most of them dying from various diseases which they were not immune to uh, that were introduced by the, uh, the Spanish population. And just to back up, Mexico became independent from Spain and the missions were secularized in the 1830s and this picture taken in 1856. The mission was still used but in between the mission and the, far, the building on the far right uh, was, was a roadhouse and this area was very popular for horse racing and there was a regular market and uh, bear and, and bull fighting. So the missions had fallen into decay by the uh, by the 1830s. If you read, for instance, Alfred Robinson's Life in California, it gives you a very vivid picture of what it would look like in the span of time between the 1820s and the 1830s when the uh, mission system was falling apart. This picture, I'm, I'm sorry to say, is hard to see, but I'm trying to give you some sense of the terrain in the mission. And this is Mission Bay right here. And this is Market Street right here. This is Market Street. And this is uh, the plank road that I spoke of. Here's the Mission down here. This is where Mission Rock is today, the Mission Rock Resort. It's where the ballpark is right here in Rincon Point, where the, uh, the bridge goes over to Yerba Buena Island. So you can see the, the Mission Bay and then Mission Creek, which ran up into uh, approximately where Dolores, uh, where Folsom Street is, um, was still um, navigable in the 1850s and up into the 1860s. And you can get a sense of, here's downtown San Francisco. This is an 1852 map. And here's the, uh, the mission. So the mission, the area immediate around, immediately around the mission had become kind of a village. And you get the beginning of San Francisco becoming a, a sort of a collection of villages, with the mission being one of them, downtown San Francisco being another, eventually the Hate, the Western Edition, and so on and so forth. Early in its history, oh, here's a, a more detailed map. Here's Mission Creek coming in from Mission Bay. And uh, there's a, actually you'll see in a later slide, there's a, there was a pier right here. And then here's um, 16th Street riding, running up to, to uh, Mission Dolores. And just back again for a second. And then here's the Plank Road uh, coming through this, you know, very, uh, sandy, sand dune, kind of scrub, scrub oak terrain. Robinson rode through it in the 1820s, said that he encountered bear and, and wolves in, uh, in this area and very little else. In its early years, the mission was known for its resorts, one of them, of course, being the resort at the Mission Dolores. This was Woodward's Gardens. It was built in the 1850s by an entrepreneur who uh, built a hotel. He actually was a, a teetotaler. He built a dry hotel downtown called the What Cheer House, which was the site of the city's first library. And then he built the Mission Plank Road and Woodward's Gardens, which sits near the restaurant Woodward's Gardens, which is at the corner of, um, what is it called under the freeway there in Mission Street? Division. Division, Division Du Bose. And uh, people would come out on the weekends in their carriages along the Mission Plank Road and another plank road that was built on, on Folsom Street to visit Woodward's Gardens and also uh, another resort known as the Willows. And here you can see the mission as a, as a separate village in a, in a kind of an agricultural landscape. So I showed you Mission Creek. Here it is right here. You can see there's a, a uh, sailing craft on it. Here's a bridge 
over it and the mission is back in here and you can see farmlands along here and then the beginnings of a kind of, of a village around, uh, around the mission itself. What year is that? This is uh, 1860. This is twin, this is, uh, I, can, I always call it Lonely Mountains, but it's not. It's the one by the Randall Museum. Corona and it, Heights. What is it called? Corona Heights. Corona Heights. Also Red Rock Hill. And then Red Rock, this is Red Rock Hill, I believe, and this is Twin Peaks up here, and this is Dolores Heights over in here. Mission also had uh, two racetracks, and uh, the first baseball game was played at Garfield Park around uh, 26 and and Harrison. And soon the mission became an industrial area and this is looking up from uh, in, in the north mission and this looks like a, a stockyard to me and there's some factories in the area and we're looking up I don't know whether this is 16th Street this could well be 16th Street but we're looking roughly from the area of around Bryant and, and 16th so this might be uh, this might be actually around a little farther north than that. And again, looking out of, out of uh, the willows toward the downtown south of Market area, and I want to call your attention to this smokestack right here because I'm going to show you a picture of that in just, an area, in just a moment. And then we're looking over at Market Street, and you can see the size of the sand dunes over at Market Street. And in fact, when they built the original city hall, which sat on this site, uh, when I was working on a book in the library, I found a, a picture of uh, a bunch of guys with wheelbarrows and shovels taking down an enormous sand dune that sat right on this site. And this is that smokestack that I showed you. This is uh, the first sugar factory in San Francisco. And it gives you a sense of, of what was going on in terms of the leveling of the city. So you get the dunes over here, and this is what was known as a steam paddy, which is a narrow gauge railroad, really, with a bunch of cars, and they're shoveling the sand in the cars to take it down and dump it to, into Mission Bay, which is what eventually happened in Mission Bay. It was partially filled uh, kind of on a steady basis up until 1906, and then when the earthquake occurred in 1906, a lot of the, of the damaged structures were, were dumped either in there or, or at the, on the north side of the city, and, and the filling proceeded and didn't really end until the uh, 1950s. And another industrial site around 16th Street, Pacific Chemical Company, and back over here we're looking south, so this is Bernal Heights over here. And in the, in the 19th century, uh, first, first the mission was hooked up to the downtown through a series of, of transportation systems. Thomas Hayes built a railroad from downtown to the mission in 1857. Horse-drawn carriages appeared on Valencia Street in 1863, and the first streetcars showed up in 1866. And the mission faced two possibilities. Uh, it was the Sun Belt, so um, it, uh, it quickly became known, starting in the 1850s and 60s for, and into the 1870s, for very large houses. First, people built uh, sort of their country homes. Uh, Francois Pioche, who was, uh, built the the mining town of Pioche in Nevada, who was a French banker and mining magnate, he built an enormous estate right next to the Mission Dolores. And he's known for having brought 40 French chefs to San Francisco and seems to have had a major impact on, on the cuisine of, of San Francisco in its early days. His estate was called the Hermitage. Uh, he built it on ranchos that he bought from the Noe and, and um, from the Noe family and the other rancho, the Rincon Rancho. And this is John Spreckel's house in the uh, typical kind of Italianate design of the time, and that was at 23rd and South Van Ness, 21st and South Van Ness. So you had wealthy San Franciscans, James Duval Phelan's father built his house on, on Valencia Street around 16th and 17th. So you get these very large houses built in some neighborhoods. Um, here's one of them today. This is at 17th and South Van Ness. And then more typically, you have the Victorians that we're familiar with in the mission. These are built by the real estate associates in the 1870s. The real estate associates were very interesting because uh, at one time it was the largest housing development company in the United States. And they built 
a thousand or more houses in San Francisco, and they were mass producing these things. We associate Victorians with kind of craft skills, hand craft skills, but they really uh, have to do with the, uh, the development of the scroll saw and the mass production of the ornamental materials that you see on the front of the buildings, um, you know, the brackets and the, and the pediments and the, and the various ornaments, the pipettes on, around the windows, which were mass produced by mills in San Francisco. And then if you were uh, a, going to buy one of these buildings, you went down to the REA office on Market Street and they showed you a series of pattern books from which you chose the design. Um, and then they built blocks of these things. And this is on Valencia between 20th and 21st, and if you go around into the Lexington Street, which is right behind it, you'll see a number of other ones. And the idea behind the Victorian, which we now s associate particularly even some of these smaller ones with kind of upscale living, was really to build uh, housing for middle-income people. And when you go back and look through the records and see who owned these houses, you'll see that uh, it ranged from mechanics, which is what skilled workers were called in those days, to white collar workers, these things ran for, uh, they sold for about $2,500 to $6,000. The blocks were laid out in such a way that the corner buildings um, were bigger and fetched a higher price. You could borrow money from REA uh, for a certain amount down, a certain amount a month, and, uh, and move in this. So, you know, keep in mind as, you, as we go into the history of the mission further that, that the Victorians were, uh, were built really with a provision of, of housing for middle-income people as the part of the strategy. And then there are different kinds. This is Harrison Street around 22nd, 23rd. So you had working Victorian cottages for the working people. And the North Mission, was, as you saw from the earlier slides, was particularly industrial. So you get these kind of, of cottages. This was, you know, it's obviously it's a four-unit building. So each one of those apartments was very small. And probably each one of these apartments had a family living in it. And then the mission became, uh, as a working community, it started to lose its identity as, a, as a, uh, a place valued by people for sort of their summer homes or for people like the Spreckles who were building large ma missions, m mansions. And it became a, a, uh, an ethnic working class community, predominantly Irish with Italians and others. And this is St. Peter's at 24th in Alabama, which burned a number of years ago and was restored. And it was built in... 1886, and it was the, uh, the home parish of Father Peter York, who was um, not only a, the parish priest, but he was an Irish nationalist and a big supporter of the labor movement in San Francisco. But there were other nationalities, immigrants in the Mission District. So the women's building, and I'm not sure who the architect or the date is on this building, but it was originally a Norwegian-American meeting hall St. John's Lutheran Church on South Van Essen 22nd, I believe, uh, was built for the German community. And then other buildings reflecting the working class neighborhood uh, nature of the, of the Mission District, such as the Sheet Metal Workers Hall on Guerrero across from Valencia Gardens. Uh, I read it somewhere that half the unions formed in San Francisco originated in um, the Mission District. And then the uh, Woodman's Hall, which is now the Baha'i Temple on, I can't remember, it's Mission or Valencia? Valencia, thank you. And uh, along with the construction of, of Union Halls, and I'll show you later the San Francisco Labor Temple, but along with the construction of, of uh, Union Halls, uh, and, and note the evolution of, of the architectural style. I showed you a kind of an Italianate building earlier on. This is a 1920s kind of deco looking building, which has recently been cleaned, so it's looking better than it looked in this picture, which I took about a year ago, was the construction of, of community service operations. This is the San Francisco Girls Club that was founded in 1896, and you can see that the shingle style is becoming popular, moving away from the Victorian style. And uh, this was uh, emblematic of the development of community services in a low-income neighborhood. It's now the Mission Neighborhood Center, and the, the that's on cap between 19th and 20th. And this is the community music center, which is in a, was a private residence that was built in um, 
the 1880s. It was founded in 1921. This is on cap, in, on cap between 20th and 21st, another venerable community institution. And then near and dear to my heart is uh, Presida Center, which is right down from where I live, which was built by neighbors in 1922. There were a number of significant developments in the early part of the, of the 20th century that shaped the mission that we know, uh, that gave the, the mission some of the characteristics that we're more familiar with today. One was the arrival of Hispanics, the Latinization of the community. The other was the construction of public housing, the beginnings of minority ownership, home ownership in the neighborhood. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, it had lost its characteristics as a, as a desirable neighborhood for wealthy people to live. They'd moved on to uh, parts of the Western Edition and. Pacific Heights. And uh, in moving into the period after the Second World War was the uh, beginning of, of white flight to the neighborhood. Someone told me that the McGuire Realty Company um, was really instrumental in building St. Francis Woods, was really instrumental in, in helping the, the Irish move out of, of the uh, mission to St. Francis Woods. So if you take a parish like St. Peter's, which I showed you earlier, it's uh, now, I read in the papers the other day, 97% Latino. It was an Irish parish up into the 50s when it began to be transformed into a Latin parish. And there's a very fine history, actually, of this parish, which describes some of the te tensions between the, uh, the Irish population and the Hispanic population. And if you look carefully at this mural, who, uh, which uh, portrays some of the heroes of, uh, of Mexican history and uh, Martin Luther King and so on. Peter York is, is nowhere to be seen. I spoke of public housing. This is the city's first public housing project built in Holly Court by Holly Court Circle in Holly Park in 1939. But more interesting is Valencia Gardens, which is at 15th and Valencia. And this was designed by William Worcester, who went on to be the, the uh, well, he designed the Bank of America building and the restoration of Ghirardelli Square. Very much influenced by uh, European architecture, modernist architecture, particularly architecture and social ideas de developed in the Bauhaus in Germany about trying to build uh, decent small-scale housing for, for low-income families. And if you've seen this uh, development, which is now surrounded by a huge fence, um, you'll notice that there are a num number of Bufano statues in the courtyards. So it was designed uh, with ample courtyards around it, two-story buildings, three-story building, flat roof, very much in the modernist style, no ornamentation, and entryways so that each family would have its, uh, its separate kind of uh, condo unit. Another building uh, from the same period, a little earlier. This is uh, the mission campus of the community college system uh, with Samuel Gompers High School. It's uh, architects Maston and Hurd from uh, 1939 in the, in the modern style. And uh, just to remind you that the mission remained an industrial neighborhood. This is the Hams Brewery, which was an early convert to a, to a live workspace. It's the Hams Brewery down at uh, just north of 16th and, and Bryant. And it was built in the late of the 1850s. I came, 1950s, I came here in 1968, and there were five breweries in this immediate neighborhood. And I think a number of you probably remember that just at the end of Bryant, there were a couple of demolished breweries that sat there for two or three years with the tanks hanging out um, before they took the brewing tanks out. And in fact, uh, this was an early uh, scene of um, a number of kind of um, crash pads where people went in and were living in the tanks, which were known as, as, the, as the vats. And then with the uh, arrival of the Latino population, of course, uh, you had people who were not only working but had small businesses. This is one on, on, uh, on Bryant Street that's been there for quite a while. This is my own neighborhood, Bernal Heights. And there were a number of significant changes in the city in the period, the post-war period. The mission became less industrial. The city, which had peaked as an industrial city really around the turn of the 20th century, was moving more and more toward a, a kind of corporate headquarters city with a very large white collar working class downtown. Uh, the immigrant population in the, in the mission, which was initially of a mixed 
uh, from mixed backgrounds in the sense that people came from Costa Rica and Mexico, but it was primarily uh, Mexican became more uh, influenced by immigrants from Nicaragua and El Salvador. And people's access to jobs was in the union sector to the extent to which the in unions were, were integrated, and that was a fight that went on, of course, after the war and, and really uh, was successful, I think, probably by the 1970s. Uh, yeah, this is, um, this is on Nevada at the top of Bernal Heights. And um, so there weren't, weren't a lot of high paying jobs available because it was hard to get into the union. So m much of the, of the uh, immigrant population went into low paying service jobs. And I just want to give you a quick, quick look at, at my neighborhood. I arrived in 1968 and uh, this, was, this is what my neighborhood looked like. Uh, this guy here who is now a, uh, a sandblaster is um, of Hawaiian Filipino extraction, this young woman I don't know. Uh, this guy's father was a, uh, a sailor and a uh, Mexican background and uh, is no longer living. Uh, African American woman who's a, a meter maid. This is the guy who took most of the photographs and his name is Richard Hall. If anybody wants to read a detailed description of a mission neighborhood, he wrote his master's thesis uh, for San Francisco State about Bernal Heights and about this particular group of people and I had it put in the library in the, in the archives. Uh, Carol Deutsch, who came from Chicago with me in 1968, she, was, she ran the Presida Center for a number of years, a young woman who moved to the mission from Pacific Heights, a woman of Portuguese Hawaiian extraction whose father was a dock worker, um, Richard's son, uh, another young Mexican-American, uh, a, a guy from, from New Mexico who was a, a uh, mailman for a number of years. He's uh, uh, interesting to note who, who ended up being homeowners too. He became a homeowner. Uh, I became a homeowner. He became a homeowner. <laughs> He's a plumber from, um, from Utah. Uh, another young man from New Mexico. Uh, young African American man who's in, in prison in Texas today. And uh, a young woman of Mexican Nicaraguan background who's also a homeowner. So it's interesting to see who these people's families were and whether they stayed in the mission. Um, I think one of the things that strikes me about these people, all of whom I've been very close to for a long time, is a, very, a number of them, particularly the, or specifically the young men, did not live. And more of my neighbors looking out at the city. This was our mayor. Uh, he was a, a painter, Italian-American from Sicily member of Local 4, which was in the Redstone Building on 16th Street, member of the San Francisco Motorcycle Club. The politics of the mission. Of course, you recognize these three gentlemen, or maybe you don't. We have John Burton on the left, Philip Burton in the second, in the center, and uh, Willie Brown on the right. <laughs> now, I, you may have a variety of opinions about, uh, about all three of these, but the thing in relation to both mission politics and the city politics is to recall that these guys and a number, you know, dozens and hundreds and thousands of other people brought about fundamental changes in the nature of city politics. Because the political class in the 1950s when these guys became active was uh, white, male, largely Irish, with some Italians, and, it, and the machine, the extent that there was a democratic machine in those days, was based in the mission. Philip Burton moved to Guerrero Street in 1954 and uh, aimed his organizing efforts not only at the mission but at Chinatown and at Hunter's Point and the Western Edition, but in the mission he aimed it right at the heart of the Irish political machine. Uh, he ran against an Irishman uh, who died during the election and, uh, and defeated Burton in his first election. He later on beat a well-known South of Market politician known as unbeatable Tommy Maloney, who was the speaker pro tem in 1956. Brown, in 1962, took on Ed Gaffney, who was another resident of the mission whose family owned a, a department store. And Brown lost in his first race, and Gaffney was quoted as having said, he beat that little nigger. The issues that really mobilized the mission had to do with the plans to build freeways in San Francisco. 
And this, of course, you're familiar with. Uh, here's 101 North. Here's 101 North going to the Golden Gate Bridge. And here it is connecting up to 80. And this is, of course, the North Mission District. And the uh, plans were laid out for the freeways in 1954 to connect the uh, freeways coming north up the peninsula to the Golden Gate Bridge and the Bay Bridge. And they were to go through uh, the areas adjacent to Golden Gate Park and through J Golden Gate Park and through um, the Mission and over Pacific Heights. And of course, the section in the Mission District was, was built. There was very little opposition. When there was opposition to the freeway construction in the Golden Gate Park area, they recommended moving it to the, uh, to the Mission District. So there would have been two freeways in the Mission, one on the east side, one on the west side, because it was considered as kind of a rundown working class neighborhood where you could get away with this kind of thing. And this really mobilized, began the mobilization of neighborhoods in Willie Brown's first successful campaign. Uh, his ability to function as a crossover politician in the black and white communities had to do with his, his uh, getting behind the fight, the so-called freeway revolt. And part of the, uh, the, the notion of rebuilding the city, of course, was redevelopment. And here's redevelopment's plans for uh, Diamond Heights. And of course, the high rises were not built, and this is the Safeway right in here. And you recognize this little park. And uh, the, the, this isn't exactly what it ended up looking like, but the Yetwa restaurant is in here, and they're kind of parking lots around here. And the mission was targeted to become part of redevelopment, particularly after Justin Herman became head of redevelopment in 1959. Uh, redevelopment, of course, started in the Western Edition where it had a disastrous impact. And by the late 1950s, the uh, Western Edition was being leveled. Um, the black and Japanese American population was being uh, run out, essentially, and relocated. I came here in 68, and uh, we had a, an office down where the Performing Arts Center garage is on Grove Street. And the Western Edition, by that time, looked like it had been carpet bombed. Residents of the mission saw what happened to the Western Edition, so when uh, Jack Shelley, Mayor Shelley, and Justin Herman decided to, uh, to expand the redevelopment agency's project areas to the Golden Gateway downtown, South of Market, Chinatown, Diamond Heights, Western Edition, A2 region, so on, the Mission District. They triggered quite a bit of opposition. People had seen what had happened to the Western Edition, and the idea was to, uh, to continue the transportation system that was started with the construction of freeways and build BART under Mission Street, connecting it up with downtown. And it was uh, in the initial reports for redevelopment of the mission, 5,000 buildings. It was recommended that 5,000 buildings be torn down, which is essentially what had happened to the Western Edition. First, BART came in and, and decimated uh, Mission Street, uh, shut it down as a functioning commercial district for a couple of years at least while they, they did the construction work on BART. There were lots of plans for, uh, for, for the mission about having, you know, if you read the plans, smart shops on Mission Street, um, high-rise clusters like this around the BART stations. This is one of the few high-rises that was actually built. But uh, a very interesting coalition of old-timers, small businessmen, Irish, Italian, Armenian, whatever background, and uh, community organizers, including um, various Marxist-Leninist groups, uh, faith-based act activists, and uh, a number of newly formed Hispanic organizations organized against uh, the redevelopment. And by 1966, they had persuaded the Board of Supervisors, with the help of John Burton and George Moscone, to have the Mission District removed from uh, uh, the redevelopment agency's control. And this was a major, major victory. And of course, what, what it did for the mission is what did not happen to the Western Edition. So if you compare the two neighborhoods, you can see the decimation and then the reconstruction of the Western Edition with a lot of really shabby low-income housing and the preservation, really, of the housing stock in, in the Mission District. And it left a, a quite a legacy. Of course, once redevelopment was driven out of the, of the uh, Mission District, the question became what to do with it. And this was uh, uh, symptomatic of, of other activities, neighborhood activities that took place at that time, uh, this was the San Francisco State Strike of 1969, which was really a very early campaign for affirmative action. A number of people from the Western Edition were trying to persuade San Francisco State to admit 
uh, Latinos from the mission to go out and, and do outreach in the community and bring Latin Latinos into the San Francisco State. When the redevelopment agency disappeared, the, uh, the organizers who had formed the mission coalition and uh, Mayor Aliotto, who was brought in to replace Jack Shelley, Jack Shelley was really ousted because of his inability to foist redevelopment on the mission. Uh, he was uh, only a one-term mayor, and Joe Aliotto, a previous head of the redevelopment agency, was brought in, and uh, there was an agreement to introduce model cities. And model cities at that time emphasized community-based planning. And this is, uh, this is part of the plan that was developed under model cities in the late 60s, early 70s for the mission. Uh, the Mission Housing Development Corporation, which you may re recognize as being around today, was of course part of that plan. And this is, uh, this is the area around uh, 16th, and uh, I think Bryant is in here someplace. Here is Petrero, so 16th and Bryant, and notions of what could be commercial and industrial space. So this was, this was a, a plan that was developed with community input, it was not a plan that was imposed on the mission by the re redevelopment agency. And this was done in 1974. The plan noted that uh, it was a community-based plan. It noted that there was a lack of federal funds for housing, and it called for creative approaches to solving the housing problems, the need for low-income housing in the mission. And it also uh, opposed the construction of, of high-rises around BART stations. Uh, model cities funding ran out in 1973, and they spent about $3 million in the mission, which should be compared to the millions and millions of dollars that was spent by the redevelopment agency around the city. Uh, ultimately, the mission coalition collapsed from internal conflict, but uh, that whole period left a very important legacy. The Mission Housing Development Corporation I mentioned earlier, this is a project of theirs on, on Valencia Street between 15th and 16th called Plaza del Sol. It was built in 1995 and designed by Hood Miller Associates with Alan Martinez. And the Mission Housing Development Corporation over the last 25 years has about, built about 1,000 units of, um, of new housing in the mission. <clears throat> and also part of the, of the effort to deal with the housing situation was an interesting preservation movement called uh, the Victorian Alliance, which was quite different from the National, uh, the San Francisco Foundation, uh, Heritage Foundation. The Victorian Alliance was started by neighborhood people in the mission in response to the butchering of Victorians, like the one on the right, which has been uh, uh, modernized or deconstructed or whatever you want to call it. And um, there were a series of, a group of homeowners who wanted to get together first to figure out, well, you know, how do you fix up your house? And, and you have to understand that in the 60s and 50s and 60s, the Victorians were considered white ele elephants. They were falling apart, they were expensive to heat, and people who had aspirations. Uh, to move up the social ladder were going to the burbs and did not aspire to live in a Victorian in the mission. So when they wrote the Mission Housing Development Corporation plan, they had a preservation element in it. And the notion was to try to spread home ownership, Victorian home ownership among moderate income people. And in fact, through an outfit called Caritas, uh, homes, a number of homes um, have been uh, renovated um, without being gentrified in the mission. Caritas is managing about a thousand units of commercial and residential space. Of course, not all of the Victorians, but the blue, the bluish Victorian here on Cap Street near 25th, near 24th, is uh, one that they renovated and, and presently manage, and they're associated with the Mission Housing Development Corporation. And then other efforts. This is a little far afield, but this is the Bernal Heights Neighborhood Foundation. Uh, being a Bernal Heights chauvinist, I have to get this in. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, market towers at the Alamany Farmers Market that was built uh, a couple of years ago. And then the new Bernal Gateway dwellings, which the scaffolding is gone, and I think it's being occupied as we speak. And this is at, at Army and Cesar Chavez. So I think the interesting thing is, is to see the legacy of the struggle against redevelopment that had a positive impact. Not only did it result in stopping the destruction, but it led to the ability to, uh, to continue community efforts toward building low-income housing. I, I wouldn't argue that the, uh, 
the amount of housing that's been built is adequate is uh, adequate to satisfy the needs of the community, but it, it, it has had a, a significant impact. And then there are other impacts of uh, life in this very interesting multi-ethnic, multi-class community. Cultural impacts, the mime troupe, of course, we all know and uh, know well, and of course, they are, are internationally renowned. They're based in the mission, founded in the mission, have been there for years and years. You may see some people in this picture that you recognize or you've forgotten that they look like that years ago. And places like the Galleria de la Raza, which was founded at 24th and Bryant Street in 1970 by a bunch of Chicano civil rights activists. Also the Mission Cultural Center on uh, Mission Street between 24th and 25th, which was also the work of all these interrelated groups of people. And uh, this, this is particularly fascinates me. Um, this was uh, a book published by Glide called Time Degrees in uh, the early 1970s by the Third World Communications Collective, which was not solely mission-based, but there were a number of, of significant mission writers involved. And it was Janice Mirkatani and Tazaki Shange, Jessica Hagedorn, Victor Hernandez Cruz. And I think that this is one of the collections, first collections of multicultural literature published in the United States. Here's the uh, editorial collective. Um, Joe Ramos on the left, who looks quite different these days, who designed the jacket, and uh, Rupert Garcia, who some of us know, and uh, Alejandro Murguia, and there's Janice Miracatani right here, who is now the poet laureate of the city, and Roberto Vargas, barrio poet, who was uh, one of my neighbors for a number of years, and so on and so forth. And of course, there was a lot of solidarity activity with uh, what was going on um, in El Salvador and Nicaragua um, at the same time. Uh, the murals of the mission, spectacular collection of murals, Presida Eyes, founded in the 1970s by Mujeres Muralistas, and have done a, a remarkable job of decorating the buildings of the mission. This is one of their uh, studios in Presida Park. They have another office down on 24th Street, and they do a lot of uh, educational stuff in the neighborhood with kids. Leonard Flynn on uh, right across the street in uh, Presida Park. And uh, I think this is, is, I'm not sure, is this a swimming pool or what, what is this building? Yeah, it's a swimming pool on Linda, on Linda sp Street. Uh, another mural. And then uh, the Bethany Old Folks Home at 21st and, and Cap with this mural. And another major event was uh, Carnival, and of course the mission is well known for its Latin music. Carlos Santana is a mission homeboy, as uh, is John Sa Santos. Nothing happened. There we go. Gentrification began really in the 70s, and we've been through three waves of gentrif gentrification in the mission district. Um, Sadly, Bohemianism in the uh, Mission District was attractive to, uh, to Bohemians starting in the, in the 50s and 1960s is often the harbinger of gentrification. Uh, houses like this one on Guerrero, this is about Guerrero and 25th, have been restored and uh, are selling, of course, at extremely high prices. And then in Bernal Heights, in my own neighborhood, where at one time 25% of the vacant lots in the city were in, were in Bernal Heights, uh, you get kind of very interesting modern architecture on some of those hillside lots. And the Mission District, uh, of course, has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. Valencia Street, where uh, I had an office in the late 1960s, virtually abandoned at the time. Most of the storefronts were boarded up is now extremely hip. And then the contrast to hipness is what you see uh, under the freeway, for instance, uh, one of the solutions to the housing problem in San Francisco. Another, this is under the interchange at Cesar Chavez and uh, 101. Uh, I drive through here every day. The population rises and falls. It gets very large. The city comes along, throws everybody's stuff out, runs everybody out. And within two or three days, it's, there's another, uh, I guess they used to call these Hoovervilles back again. And then starting in the 1990s, you have the arrival of the dot-coms. This is a building on, on Bryant and Cesar Chavez. And they moved particularly into the North Mission District, targeting old industrial buildings. This is uh, best 
Foods and another factory on, Knight, on Bryant, uh, right across from uh, KQED. And uh, a lot of these places were converted or in the process of being converted to live workspaces. New live workspaces were built. This is one of the kind of poster child uh, live work efforts that um, was built uh, ostensibly as a live work um, building to avoid the various fees and taxes that uh, residential buildings have to use. And it's not at all residential and is barely occupied. And of course, this is kind of dropped down, sadly, this slide. Um, <coughs> resistance in the community to the arrival of the dot coms, the fights over Proposition K and L, and uh, quite a bit of success, although not on the proposition, but in terms of electing the, the current Board of Supervisors. And of course, one of the targets of the re resistance in the community, the anti-displacement movement in the mission was uh, our favorite developer and a friend of mayor, Joe O'Donohue, described in San Francisco Ma Magazine as a neighborhood bully. And various centers of resistance, cell space on Bryant Street, which is a uh, community arts center, uh, aspiring to take this, this particular building over to turn it into a, a community arts center on a, on a permanent basis. And the old labor temple, uh, which is now the Redstone Building, site of the Rhinoceros Theater, and also another center of, of res resistance to displacement, number of artists and nonprofits living in this area. And then something new. Um, I should mention that there was a moratorium uh, passed by the Board of Supervisors on the construction of live work. This is John O'Connell. This is a new high school on Bryant Street, just opened the other day, designed by Marshall Lee. Um, Interestingly, this was a, it's a vocational high school, so you know, sort of was a basic course in auto mechanics and that kind of thing, and now they're teaching electronics. And uh, it's a very attractive building. So I've given you a kind of a very quick run through on the, on the history and architecture of, of the mission of a very intriguing and dynamic community. And I, I think of the Victorians often when I, when I think of the mission district because the original notion of the Victorian um, which is described so well in Randolph uh, Delahanty's book in the Victorian style, was really to build housing for moderate income people. And uh, the notion of the mission originally as this kind of mixed class, mixed race neighborhood uh, was to be a, a group of people from a wide variety of backgrounds. And um, that tradition continues today. And there's been a lot of pressure on the community to change um, and the, uh, you know, the lower income people are definitely being squeezed out, but uh, partly due to uh, the downturn in the economy, there's still uh, all sorts of opportunities for the mission to preserve its, its basic characteristics. Thank you very much. Uh, questions or Comments? Somebody have a mic? Does somebody have a mic? David, they're recording this and they wanted to get the questions on a mic. Yeah, it's just for the uh, recording equipment. Okay, I'll repeat the questions. You want me to repeat the questions, Dave? That'll be great. Okay. Yes, ma'am. You know, I don't know where it originally was. Uh, I became aware of it. It was on uh, Bryant at uh, 8th. And I don't know if that was the original building, but it's only been in the Mission District for in the last 10 years. And that building was, was built. And then, of course, it's an architectural atrocity. And yeah, it was built specifically for KQED and to uh, house their operations, which, to my mind, uh, I like the radio station, the TV station sort of recycles the stuff that comes out of, out of uh, the rest of the system. And, you know, KQED was known for its local programming. We had a local news program. We had a lot of very excellent um, uh, programs on television, and very little that's done anymore. Yes? Sir, Here we go. I forgot to repeat the, <laughs> I forgot to repeat the question. Years ago, there were a whole group who 
there was a large group of gay couples, men and women, who moved into Bernal Heights because they wanted to take advantage of uh, the good weather there. You didn't mention any of them at all. Well, that's very interesting because um, I moved in 1968, which is 33 years ago, and uh, that was very much a phenomenon on my block. There were three gay couples on that block, uh, very living very discreet, very quiet lives, because uh, as you know, the gay community was not that out. Right. And the other thing that, you, that I didn't mention, which I meant to when I was showing that line of houses, was that um, I was talking about minority home ownership. Bernal Heights was one of the few neighborhoods in the city where uh, a person of color could buy a house, because you know we had a housing uh, restrictions up into uh, I think 19, early 1960s. And I, my neighbors, uh, which is a very mixed group of people, have not, many of them been there since the immediate post-war years because it was the only place that they could buy a, a house in the city. So it has this very interesting characteristic kind of around the margins of this kind of refuge community for homeowners. Thank, thank you for it. Well, there are two of them. There's St. Anthony's and St. Peter's, and I think the Sicilians were knocking heads with the, um, the northern Italians. Immaculate Conceptions on Folsom, and St. Peter's burned down has been re rebuilt. They could not build the size of the structure. They couldn't afford to build the one that was, that was burned. It was sadly burned by somebody robbing the poor box a number of years ago. But Immaculate Conception was there, and it was the site of a famous miracle a number of years ago where where people claim that they saw uh, Jesus Christ in the, in the roof of the building and they had to, they had to block. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> they had to block off Folsom Street with police barricades because there were so many people praying in front of Immaculate, immaculate Conception. <laughs> Somebody else? Danny. Ask it again. There's a couple of muni divisions out there in the missions, about Flint and uh, Ferro. And I'm wondering what the history of that construction was, or why they were built there, or what their relationship to the neighborhood was. Do you know anything about it? Got me. I mean, my, the, the one on, uh, on Harrison, I would assume it was built there because it was in, in both of them were fairly close together because it was largely an industrial area. And, but I, I don't really know. Please. I'm waiting for her. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, would you define the difference between Peralta Heights and Bernal Heights? Okay, Peralta Heights is a, in Presida Valley, I mean, you can get really precise here. Presida Valley is where the water runs down between Alabama and Folsom and ran into Presida Creek, which then hooked up with Islas Creek just past, just east of the freeway. Peralta Heights sits over the freeway and it's sort of York in Hampshire, and actually I found a photograph in the library archives showing Peralta Heights before they carved off the east side of Bernal Heights. In other words, they carved off the east side of Bernal Heights and leveled it off and put 101 on it. And prior to that, there had been a, a Heights that extended farther to the east, and there were a large number of Victorian houses sitting on that. And I saw this picture and I was just staggered by the number of you know, how, densely the develop, how de dense the development was and how far, much farther to the east. It went about a couple blocks farther to the east. Question on architect. Um, I noticed when you talked about all of the um, <coughs> middle income Victorians that we could buy, that they could buy, mm -hmm. they all had flat windows. They had the bay window, but it was mm -hmm. three-sided with flat glass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you showed the mansions beforehand, and they had the rounded windows, mm -hmm. the old, okay? So was that sort of like, was that an easy way to tell when it was, I mean, I'm, I keep wanting to say prefab, but obviously they weren't prefab, but was that sort of where the, where the drop off came, where the round windows went away unless you had a big giant mansion from sugar? And no, then, you mean, you know, did, the, did the fancier ones have the rounded windows? Right. And I, I don't think so, it's the, the style evolves from from the, the bay window, um, which is slightly tapered on the side, I don't know how to describe it exactly, into the square around window, the, the squared off right. bay window, which is when you're moving into the uh, East Lake 
um, style and the stick style. So that's, that's architectural historians, which I don't claim to be a great expert on architecture, by the way, I'm a historian more by trade. But the differentiation they make, which I, I explain in the book, is around the shapes of the bays. But it doesn't have to do with the windows being, being rounded themselves, unless there's someone here who is more knowledgeable and can correct me. <laughs> Susan. Hi, Peter. Um, I noticed at one point you were referring to a house or an area that had been renovated but not gentrified. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how you differentiate those two terms. Okay. Um, Mission Housing Development Corporation works with an outfit called Caritas. And Caritas manages and manages the renovation of old residential and commercial buildings, and a number of those are Victorians. Some of those are privately owned by people who have been subsidized in one way or another to buy them. Some of them are owned and rented. And the, the guidelines developed in the Mission Housing Development Corporation called for an attempt to restore Victorians so that ownership of Victorians could be distributed equitably among low-income people. And you know, I don't mean to knock the heritage for San Francisco's architectural, um, the foundation for San Francisco's architectural heritage. But heritage started in the Western edition to preserve historians, but they kind of went through and cherry-picked a few of the Victorians that they could persuade redevelopment agency to allow them to move, and they moved them to beat them in place out by Divisadero. And there was no effort at that point to try to, uh, at least among Heritage, I mean, Heritage later on did try some efforts like this, didn't get very far. But specifically in the original 1974 plan, there was a call for an effort, and there's actually a guidebook on, on the mission, on Victorians and the mission that was developed as part of, a part of this effort. So the notion was that you, know, you could protect the housing stock and not have gentrification, where gentrification means people of better means coming in and buying cheap housing. And you know, that's basically is what happened. I mean, I'm essentially, I'm a suburbanite from New Jersey. I won't even tell you what I paid for the house that I bought in Bernal Heights, and that's gentrification. You got one way in the back here. slightly familiar with the redevelopment activities that happened in different cities in the United States. And there was a lot of pressure. It was what was hip in urban planning at the time. But what drove um, the planners in San Francisco to choose the Western Edition and the Mission? Was it um, issues with maintenance of the housing, or was it trying to increase the housing density? What were they driving? What were they trying to achieve with redevelopment? Um, you know, I, I think this is, this is an area that really needs to be more fully investigated. But in the research that I did, there was a private housing agency, an advocate for housing and the reconstruction and remodeling of housing in San Francisco in the late 1940s. And they targeted the Western, Western edition. It was dead on racism. And I mean, it's, the language is despicable about uh, you know, white and bright communities like the marina and dark and grimy communities, black communities, we're not saying black skinned people, but it was, it was dead on racism. So that was a private agency. Redevelopment agency comes along and says a number of things. One, prime real estate adjacent to city hall. Two, uh, what we call Cathedral Heights, you know, not only prime real estate, but prime real estate with, with um, views. Uh, three, uh, dilapidated housing stock. And the original intent was in the A1 district, which was along Geary Street, and that was the first um, project. Golden Gateway was the first commercial one downtown, commercial, mixed commercial and residential. It was very clear, the, the initial intent was very clearly to uh, clean out the low income people, clean out the, the housing stock. There was absolutely no thought given to preservation whatsoever. The redevelopment agency's reports on historic buildings are absurd, and I quote them in my book about how they were. I think they said there were something like five historic buildings in San Francisco, and one of them was in the Western Edition. I mean, they had no idea what they were talking about. Uh, no interest in 
in preserving or restoring or fixing up the housing stock for the primarily renting populace there, although there were homeowners there, and there still are. There's a large African-American homeowning community, particularly in the western part of the Western Edition. So um, it was only when the community organized, and you, when you start thinking back, oh, the Civil Rights Movement. Well, you know, there happens to be a sort of a coincidental thing going on, Automobile Row, um, organizing in the Western Edition. Only when that started to pick up speed it was Justin Herman forced to change a lot of the ideas of what would happen. So the uh, ILWU was brought in and they built St. Francis Square, which is cooperative housing. But I think the, the interesting thing about St. Francis Square, which is in some ways a model project, with, it only uh, took one family that had been dislocated from the neighborhood. Everybody else moved in from the outside. It just wasn't, they weren't, they weren't upper income or middle income people, they were low income people because that was the notion. But if you walk around St. Mary's Cathedral, you'll see the Presbyterian Church, for instance, has a number of um, kind of elder care facilities. Uh, the Lutherans, St. Mark's there, that's a really interesting, they have a little, you know, these little histories of churches and neighborhoods are, are rich with material and they got involved in it and then when the resistance, the, the pastor at St. Mark's was appalled at what was going on because that was a, a prime area to be targeted and at first they endorse it and then they realize that what was being done to the community. So they got in and they built the St. Mark's complex there, I think it's called the Lutheran Life Center or something. Um, so you know, the, 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 the idea of redevelopment was modified um, because of community pressure. And you know, it's a whole very complicated story about the A2 district, which is down around Grove and McAllister Street, where basically they, they got the um, black ministers in the area to uh, get involved in building. Each one sort of got their own little housing development. And, you know, I mean, the, the scams are a mile long, and I'm, I'm afraid most of the records have been destroyed. But you know, it, it's one of my ambitions is to go back over this terrain um, and try to figure out what happened. And you know, Danny says, talk to Leroy King, because <laughs> he knows. Uh, any other questions? We've got one down here in the front. It's right here. There appears to be a large number of um, Victorian mansions that were built on South Dynamics between around 18th and 24th Streets. And they appear to be, um, or to have been built before the 1906 earthquake. Is there a reason why a large number of those structures remain untouched from that? Yeah, it was, uh, the Mission District was the Sun Belt, and it was considered a very desirable place, and it was semi-rural. And there were clusters of development, there were clusters of factories in the North Mission, but it was fairly undeveloped. Um, our mayor, um, Sonny Jim Rolfe, for instance, he had a very, fancy house at 25th in San Jose. So there were a number of houses, you look on Dolores Street for instance, there's in Guerrero, there were a number of very large houses. So it was considered a very desirable place to build originally, but then as it became more working class, it, it was not considered a place that you wanted to, you know, you, you went to St. Francis Woods or, not St. Francis Woods, you went to Pacific Heights or, or Russian Hill or Knob Hill to build rather than that district. But initially it was appealing and there were actually country estates built out there very early on, 1850s, 1860s, because it was rural. Was that your question? Um, kind of. The, the structures are still remaining there, and I believe that they were built before the Lord Earth. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't get the connection with the earthquake. Um, but I was wondering why many of those remain untouched. Because um, they, they stopped the fire. <laughs> and if you look at, um, for instance, Gladys Hansen's book on the fire, you can see very clearly the map and it burns south into the mission, and I can't give you the exact line, but if you look at the buildings, you can figure out where the line is. Everything up to that line, which is around 18, 18th Street, um, burned. Everything north of the line, north and east of that line, burned. But by dynamiting and setting backfires, they, they were able to stop it. And so that was all protected. We need to... Uh, yeah, we, we need to wind that up because the library's closed and, and uh, the security guard's going to pull the lights and there's going to be a blackout. It'll all be over. Thank you. Thank you.